Well, good evening. I'm, I'm Melvin Churchill. Um, those of you who don't know me, um, uh, I've been here a while. I've been a rheumatologist. I actually grew up in Seward, Nebraska. I went to the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, and then I went to medical school in Omaha at the University as well. Um, did internal medicine there for a while, and then I transferred to the Mayo Clinic, and I spent five years there, which were gloriously entertaining learning years. Um, finished internal medicine there as, as well as rheumatology. Did some research and published some articles and, and had a lot of fun with a lot of amazingly brilliant people. And the, the fact is when I went there I had no idea I was going to become a rheumatologist. It sort of evolved over time with uh, an evolution of experiences in various parts of the uh, rheumatology services that, or the various services I was involved in. If I was in cardiology, I was seeing vasculitis of the heart. And if I was in pulmonary, I was seeing some vasculitis related pulmonary disease related to some autoimmune disorder. I was on and on and on. So every time I turned around, I was seeing an autoimmune disease in some various organ system related to some systemic illness, which is what I wind up doing. I'm the guy who brings all those little pieces together to create diagnoses and deal with the autoimmune or connective tissue disease that that individual is presented with. So I can remember seeing 23-year-old you know, women with vasculitis in their heart. You know, who would have thought, you know, that's unusual. Uh, people with renal disease who had vasculitis in their kidneys and their skin and their arteries in various places. People with all sorts of swollen joints and various kinds. And back then, we had very few treatments that really worked as well as they do today. So we saw a lot of complications and very severely ill individuals. Unfortunately, we don't see as many of today as we did back then. So to make a long story short, I'm going to talk about one of those connective tissue diseases this evening. And actually, a, a group of diseases that are all kind of connected that relate to the spine. And so not every pain that comes to my office is a necessarily inflammatory back problem, but this group is an inflammatory process within the bones and spine and ligaments that presents with back pain frequently, or it may present in other ways, and we'll talk about some of the other features that fall into this category of illness. So the term ankylosing spondylitis, first of all, just to define what it is, ankylosing means to fuse, when something freezes, the bones grow together and they don't move anymore. Spondylitis means inflammation of the spine. So it's a term of inflammation, spinal involvement, and eventually if it proceeds throughout its course unabated, it will cause fusion of the spine. So we're going to talk about that. But his spine is rather straight. You look at the lower part of his back, just above his briefs, it's, he's a pretty straight fellow. Most people aren't like that. We usually have an indentation back here we call lordosis, and it's gone. As he bends forward, you can see that his lumbar spine or lower back stays very, very straight, and he's limited by his hamstrings primarily, but he doesn't bend in his spine whatsoever. You can see his neck's moving forward a little bit, but the remainder of his spine is rigid. So that fellow has an inflammatory spine disease. He's lost his curvature in his spine and is frozen. He's not moving. The most of his spine is just frozen. So that's what is out there. And there's some individuals who have that walking around, around you every day. You just don't always recognize them. When I was in, at the Mayo Clinic, interestingly enough, that my neighbor across the street was a, a framer of, of pictures he had a little business, and this fellow was way over like this. He was basically legally blind. He could not look 300 feet in front of him. So actually when he sat down on a chair, he was obviously lying down like this so he could look at you. He was totally fused in a very, very curved position. So fortunately, we don't see a lot of people like that anymore, but they do exist. And, that, and that's an inflammatory spine disease. He had that since he was a young person, 
the reality is this disease is considered relatively rare, possibly. Some people think so, but it's probably as, nearly as common as rheumatoid arthritis. It's, uh, it causes a loss of functionality and people are absent from work because of it. It's very disabling when it's active. Quality of life is terrible. I had a young man in my office yesterday who was presently on a good drug and he's feeling better. I was having him describe his symptoms to my nurse practitioner, I said, tell him how you, tell her how you felt before this treatment came along. And his description was very vivid. He said, I was miserable. I said, and it didn't get better day or night. He said, I never slept at night. It was that bad. It was just ongoing forever kind of pain. This fellow was, uh, had it since he was a youngster, actually. Started off having it as a juvenile. Uh, it's much more common in men, and typically young men, and it's it's not an easy task to diagnose this early in early uh, life in young men because uh, when they're really young, the bones haven't finished growing, and so the X-rays are not clear, and the symptoms are sometimes a little bit vague, and there may be other extenuating circumstances. Someone ever everybody kind of passes it off and says, "Oh, you know, you're working too hard, you're playing too hard," any number of things can. Uh, come to mind to explain away these symptoms. So it's not as easily diagnosed early on as one might like. There's not a simple single test that tells you that's what it is. So there's this group of diseases and ankylosing spinalitis is basically the hub. All these individuals in these various circles have inflammation in their spine or joints that's connected to this particular diagnosis. Psoriasis-related patients have, may have inflammation in their spine and ligaments and tendons as well as their joints and their skin. Some people with uveitis, that's an inflammatory eye disorder, may have spondylitis as well. Many don't, but you, if they have inflammatory eye disease, one of the things I'm often asked to do is see people with inflammatory eye disease and si decide if it's really related to some connective tissue disease or not. Uh, some people get an infection and subsequently, because of their genetic predisposition, develop inflammation of their spine. That's seen with some of the bowel infections, for example. Um, items like uh, shigellosis and salmonella and a few other bacterial infections in the bowel may in turn activate an inborn reaction in the inflammatory process, which creates inflammation of the spine. There's actually a story about a ship, a literally, a ship of sailors who had it, and there was a dysentery on board, and many of them got really sick. And a high percentage of individuals in that ship subsequently developed a condition known as Rider's disease. And a certain position, part of those individuals had inflammatory spine disease as part of that illness. So there's a, sometimes a reaction to an infection which triggers an inflammatory response in the body if you're genetically predisposed and individuals with this group of disease are definitely genetically predisposed. Another condition called inflammatory spine disease, uh, bowel disease, uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, uh, that group of individuals, a certain subset of that group will also have inflammation in their spine. And then some start off with this disease when they're young. It's typically young males, usually the, between 8 and 12 years of age if it happens at that group. Then there are some people who have all of this at the same time. I've had individuals in my practice with spondylitis, Crohn's disease, uveitis, and psoriasis, all at the same time. So the extra ticket manifestations, those things outside the spine, are actually, um, you know, fairly common. As many as 42% of individuals uh, have something other than their spinal symptoms. Then there's a batch that a fair size of 58% do not. Here's an inflammatory process in a, an Achilles tendon, for example. One of the things this disease does outside of the spine is cause inflammation in the ligament attachments or tendon attachments. And it's, it's where the ligament and the fibrous tissue inter, intervenes between the muscle and the tendon and the bone. There's a little piece of tissue there that's <laughs> the attachment portion. It's a, it's a fibro cartilage kind of thing. It's made out of a fibrous ligamentous, whatever you want to call it. I call it the gristle 
the stuff that kind of holds you together. And that becomes inflamed, and we call that anisopathy. Anisopathy means the attachment site. So at all these attachment sites in the body, in the spine and the ligaments outside the spine, that's where the inflammation hits and this, this set of conditions. You can see the right one's quite swollen. There's an individual who has had a scan, and you can see there's inflammation in that white area underneath the heel of that individual. Uh, that's where the inflammatory process is in the ligament known as the plantar fascia as underneath the heel. Where it, people talk about plantar fascia, and usually it's overused and traumatic, but in this disease, it's an inflammatory process caused by this underlying connective tissue disorder. Here's an old uh, bone scan, as we used to call them. Uh, they, uh, basically, what this one shows is that in this heel on the right, there's inflammation where the Achilles tendon attaches at the back of the foot. And on this side, there's inflammation on the bottom of the heel or the plantar fascia where there's an attachment of the ligaments to the bone. The big toes are inflamed uh, as well. You'll see in the second and third uh, digit on the left foot where the toes attach are inflamed. So this one person has not only inflammation of the ligaments, but inflammation of the joints. The ankles are also a little bit swollen and uh, inflamed. So they're somewhat darker than normal. This is um, uveitis. Uveitis will present itself with a very red eye. It's painful. The vision is very, very blurry. And it's an emergency. This needs to be treated promptly. You can lose, lose, people can lose their vision. Uh, it is responsive, typically, to corticosteroids, either topically with eye drops. Sometimes they inject steroids in the eye. Sometimes they even use these little inserts to do slow-release steroids. But on top of that, we use other medications now that are newer and available to help deal with the disease in general, and that helps the eye as well. It comes on rather abruptly. It's usually in one eye, fortunately, and not both eyes as a rule. It's in the anterior part of the eye, which is the iris, where the iris is. So we can all look in our eye and know where the iris is. It's, that's the anterior chamber of the eye, and that's the part that's inflamed. And people that have this very long, the iris shrinks and scars, and it doesn't move. It loses its ability to move in and out and change with light exposure. It does happen over and over again if it's not controlled. And it's frequently associated with this genetic test we'll talk about called HLA-B27. HLA-B27 is, is a tissue transplant study. Uh, back in the uh, late 80s, they did clinical studies on people's blood. And at, at blood banks, for example, they would study all the people that had a certain disease, and they found out that people with this product, uh, disease known as ankylosing spondylitis, 90 to 95% of them have HLA-B27 positivity. So there's a high genetic predisposition in those eight people that are susceptible. On the other hand, only about one out of three people that have HLA-B27 positivity are likely to have one of these illnesses. So it's not an all or none situation. This is psoriasis, uh, scaly red patches uh, on the palm of the hand. Frequently it's on the back of the elbows, on the knees, but it can do just about anywhere, the scalp. And sometimes it's not all that obvious. You might find a little patch of it in the umbilicus, a little bit behind one ear. Doesn't have to be a lot of it, but it's a clue. And one of the clues is actually the nails. So the fingernails may be affected, and yet the skin is otherwise normal. You may see a small little bit of lifting of the nail. There may be pitting in the nail. As it comes out and grows, the little pits are in there. There's sometimes it's color, color variation at the base of the nail. Sometimes red spots, sometimes white spots, sometimes long uh, splinter-like uh, black spots. So there's a lot of things that psoriasis can do to the nail. That may be the only clue that, that, that you find. So on the physical exam, when the rheumatologist like myself walks in the room and they're talking about back pain, I'm checking nails. I'm checking everywhere. Um, if you don't have your clothes off, you haven't been examined properly <coughs> by a rheumatologist. Because this is a, an example of psoriasis, the nail. This is uh, crusting and flaking. 
uh, it's uh, the nail crumbles, and it's uh, not very pretty. It doesn't hurt particularly as a rule unless the joint's inflamed. Uh, people with nail involvement frequently have inflammation in these joints at the end of their fingers, called the distal interphalangeal joints, but not always. There's a finger that's quite swollen on the right hand, the right middle finger, and you can see the thumbs are thickened as well. The nails are affected. That's a big, fat finger, and we have a fancy term for that. We call it dactylitis. When the whole finger is swollen like a sausage, or a toe is swollen like a sausage, so we call that dactylitis. So it's inflammation not only of the joint, but also the soft tissues and the ligaments all the way up and down that finger. That's rather typical, this group of diseases. We don't see that in rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or gout. That when you see a big, long, sausage-shaped digit, finger or toe, that's an indication that this group of diseases may be uh, under, your, under your nose. This is what happens in the bowel, and we're all familiar with canker sores in the mouth. Well, these are basically canker sores in, this, in the bowel itself. And this is Crohn's disease. Um, people with uh, inflammatory bowel disease not infrequently have aphthous lesions or canker sores in the mouth as well as in their bowel. Sometimes the clue is rather elusive. A uh, patient may not have a lot of bowel symptoms. I took care of a young man who was in his teen, a teenager, a young boy, he kept coming in with recurrent knee effusions year in and year out, two or three times a year. I drain a couple hundred cc's off one of his knees. Big, big knee effusions. Um, never could find anything particularly wrong with him. And then one day he started having abdominal pain. And lo and behold, he had Crohn's disease, and it was only in his duodenum, which is that little piece of bowel just past the stomach. It wasn't in the, the rest of his bowel was clear as a bell. He presented with epigastric pain. We thought he had an ulcer, because the same sort of symptoms were occurring. He had epigastric middle, right below your breastbone pain, and uh, it wasn't getting better with the typical treatments. We stopped his medicine, and when he was scoped, they found Crohn's disease in his, uh, the very first part of his small bowel called the du duodenum. So sometimes the clues don't come all at once. They sometimes show up later. So how do you make the diagnosis? Well, first of all, the story of the back pain itself is very important. It's an inflammatory kind of set of symptoms we'll just talk about. They may, you may have swollen joints. You may have swollen tendon attachments. You may have inflammation in your eye. You may have inflammation in your lower back in the sacroiliac region, and that's the hallmark of this illness, is the inflammation of the sacroiliac joint. And we can detect that by x-rays if it's far enough along, or by MRI scans, which are much more sensitive and pick up earlier signs of inflammation than plain x-rays. They frequently have elevated inflammatory markers in the blood, sedimentation rate or in the CRP or C-reactive protein. Both of those markers may be elevated, as, and, a, and particularly if they're untreated. And typically, a non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, such as indomethacin or naproxen in full dose, will help some with the symptoms. So it is responsive to anti-inflammatory medicines that you can take by mouth. So there's a, all these things kind of or sitting on your table. You look for all these clues, see what pieces of the puzzle you have, and see if you have enough to make a diagnosis. So the genetic story, uh, B27 positivity is frequently seen, uh, particularly if they're the typical ankylosing spondylitis. Um, in the patients with reactive inflammation from infections, the B27 positivity uh, ratio is only about 60 to 70 percent. A strong family history will be a clue. Uh, it's a very genetically engineered disease, and so there may be an uncle or a father or a grandfather who had a hunchback uh, or some other form of arthritis. You know, look for these associated illnesses. Look for infections in the bowel as well as for the underlying inflammatory bowel disease. Look for psoriasis. Uh, see if the patient ever had inflammation in their eye that was serious enough to require cortisone eye drops, things of that nature. So what does inflammatory back symptomatology mean? That means, typically, it comes on kind of gradually, it, it picks up speed and intensity. It's frequently 
better after you exercise and not worse like the typical you know back pain where if you overdo it and lift too much and bend too much it gets worse uh, usually gets better it doesn't improve with rest and night pain is very very typical the stuff is intense at night wakes people up and it doesn't improve uh, as fast as people would like There's, their back stays stiff sometimes for hours maybe by middle of the day it'll get better it can take quite a while so if you have four out of five of these uh, symptoms in together all these little symptoms historically then you may well have inflammatory back disease so that's probably the most important thing is knowing how to listen to the story ask the right questions and elicit the information that will tell you whether this pain is what we call mechanical back pain or is it inflammatory back pain or is it something coming from a bad disc the trick there is this inflammation in the spine can cause disc-like symptoms. It can cause sciatica on occasion. So sciatica in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean you have a bad disc. It could be inflammatory spine disease, but that's less common, but nevertheless possible. So this is a, some criteria that were put together back in 1984. This is before MRI scans were popular or available, frankly. Um, we looked for limitation of motion in the back, persistent symptoms for at least three months, improved with exercise, not relieved by rest, limited mobility in the back. The first thing that disappears is the ability to bend backwards, or what we call it to extend the back. You can't arch your lower back the way you did at one time. Chest expansion is diminished. The rib attachments are inflamed and you lose your ability to take a deep breath. Uh, there's various ways to measure all this, but good old uh, piece of, uh, you know, the, the, the tailor's uh, cloth uh, measuring tape is very important to rheumatologists, I, except they always seem to disappear when I need one. Uh, and then you look at their x-rays and see if they have inflammatory spine changes. And this is graded, radiologists have grading. Um, but typically, you know, in the early symptoms, you're not going to see much. And if it's a 20-year-old young male who's still growing, that area within the spine and sacral-like -like area of the back, it's kind of hard to read anyway. It doesn't look quite normal to begin with because it hasn't finished growing. So and in youngsters, as teenage boys in particular, it's really hard. So the MRIs helped us a lot to differentiate that. In the days when this criteria was put together, um, that wasn't readily available and wasn't part of the thought process. That's changed. So there's the early symptoms. You can see sacroiliitis on the MRI scan with appropriate symptomatic inflammatory back symptoms, symptoms. And then later, only after you can see radiographic signs, can you actually say by that criteria that you have the diagnosis. So this is an old criteria we don't hang our hat on as readily now as we used to. If you happen to have all that, fine, but, and sometimes, surprisingly, I've had people wander in here who's had, tell me, oh yeah, I've had back pain for years, I've had back pain for years, and their sacral joints are fused. I said, how did you live through all that? Oh, I don't know, I was pretty tough, but I did it, you know, literally, and it never was picked up. I've seen 50, 60, 70 year old people with, walking in with infused, fused sacral joints, and yet they had no, uh, no diagnosis. And you know they had to have had it for years. So on the left, or on your left, you can see down here in the sacroiliac region where the arrows point, those white bright spots, that's where the ligaments are attaching in the sacroiliac region. And they're edematous, they're swollen, they're inflamed. And that area is bright. We use specific kinds of uh, MRI uh, adjustments called stir imaging to uh, allow us to see that inflammatory response. Over time, what you see on plain films is areas of increased bone density. You see how bright it is, it's sort of white. And if you look close at the sacral act joint, there's some areas that are actually broader on other areas where there's actually erosions in the field of vision. And there's an inflammatory process on both sides of the joint. It's both on the outer iliac part as well as the sacral part of the x-ray. And that's important. So, if you've had back pain and you're under 45 and it's lasted for more than three months, ask the right questions to see if it's 
inflammatory spine disease or not. Look for sacroiliitis on some form of imaging technique. If the plain films don't show it, an MRI scan is warranted. And if there's a reasonably high uh, index of suspicion, go ahead and order an HLA-B27. It's somewhat helpful, but it doesn't make the diagnosis. And they said that 8% of the population has uh, this uh, di genetic code, but only a, a third of them uh, may have this diagnosis. Now, it's not limited to men. It has been it is seen in women. And so don't let that take that out of the equation on the female side. But if you have any of these issues, we tell our referring physicians, this is a good case for rheumatologists to review and have a closer look at. Any of those things should make people. So when I talk to primary care physicians, I use similar, much the same slides, and I tell them, you know, listen to the story, think about some x-rays, and think about a B27 if you wish. Or if the story fits, send them over to me and I'll take care of all that. We'll, figure, we'll try to figure it out. Well, there are other reasons for hunchbacks, yeah, obviously. But, but, yeah, and then also has, your spine is, is not straight, it's, what is, what is that called? Well, that's called scoliosis. This doesn't cause scoliosis. Okay. What, what this so, causes is an arching or kyphosis. Okay. Right. Uh, but more importantly, in the lumbar spine, instead of being curved in, like so, it loses, it's, it flattens okay. out. So the curvy thing that, you know, causes people to yeah. lean a little bit or have, seem to have one leg longer. That's not what this disease is. I and, uh, to clarify in my mind what I heard. Yeah, so when you see most, I mean, most people that you see are a little bit rounded. It's either just bad habits or postural degenerative change. Of course, osteoporosis and time, as you know, will lead to arching of the back, but that's not going to be seen in a 20 to 30 or 40 year old male as a rule. Um, so, but anyway, um, did I answer your question? Yes, okay. thank you very much. No, okay. Um, the, the thing that's interesting is uh, when reviewing large databases, there's a significant delay in diagnosis, and on average it's nine years between the onset of symptoms and the diagnosis when people looked at uh, large databases. So this is uh, another sacroiliac image, and you can see where the red arrows point to those bright spots, the white spots. That's inflammation of the sacroiliac joint. It's actually a little bit on the other side as well. But again, note that it's on both sides of the SI joint. This kind of curvilinear line is SI joint. And on that side, you'll see the bright white is on both sides of the joint, and that's important. The other thing the MRI scan does for you is rule out some other things. It helps you rule out infection and cancer and other odd uh, things that can obviously cause back pain. I mean, one of the, if you have a discitis or inflammatory disc disease that's related to an infection, uh, you've got a pretty stiff back too, your set rate's up too, and it's, but it's a really disabling, acutely severe pain, which is, uh, is certainly going to show up on that scan if it'll be in the disc space. If you have a fractured spine, I mean, if, you're, if you have an osteoporosis-related fracture, an MRI scan will pick up a subtle fracture that a plain x-ray might not see. So there are other things that you can find there that can cause back pain. So not only does the MRI scan help confirm the diagnosis, that excludes a few other things as well. So here's the, the same sort of process, only it's in the spine, little red marks along the anterior part of the spine there. Just in front of the disc space, you'll see all that white border there. That's the ligament in the front of the spine, and those are the margins of the vertebral bodies where the ligaments attach, and they get shiny, and we call those shiny corners. But that's the inflammatory process in the spine, and over time that ligament fuses and calcifies and becomes rigid, and you get what's known as a bamboo spine. Now literally, from the front, it, all those ligaments along the side calcify, and it looks like a bamboo pole. Well, here's an MRI of the entire body, 
and this shows inflammation in lots of places right of this illness. There's some in the, in the knee, some in the, around the hip, the shoulder, as well as the spine. So it causes not only ligament attachment inflammation, but also some joint inflammation as well. For the most part, uh, and many times, the uh, joint inflammation is in the lower extremities, and that's the clue. It tends to be less often seen in the upper arms and hands, but more often in the feet. And it's usually not altogether symmetrical. It's usually one ankle, not both. It's usually one, one heel and not both. It's kind of a little bit patchy, not entirely symmetrical. Like typical rheumatoid arthritis tends to be more symmetrical. So, here you go. Bring me your MRI scan. That's how you can pick this diagnosis up earlier. I always tell people my crystal ball fell in the Atlantic Ocean some years ago, and they haven't found it yet. So, the thing that's really important, and what's really changed the dynamic with these, are the TNF blockers. Those are the agents we use in rheumatoid arthritis. They're known as Enbrel, Remicade, uh, Humira, Simsia, and now Symphony. Those five are available. Uh, but this uh, set of medications really changes the life for people with this illness. You can, some people respond somewhat to uh, sulfazalazine with the peripheral arthritis, but there's absolutely no proof that items like methotrexate and sulfazalazine, plaquenil, leflunamide, imuran, all those other things that we use to suppress the immune system have any impact on this disease. Um, hard to get insurance companies to believe that, but that's the truth. Uh, they sometimes force us to do something temporarily, but it, it never really makes a difference. Corticosteroids help some. Back in the old days, the best drug was butazolidine. I'm sure some of you remember the term bute. Uh, butazolidine was a phenomenal non steroidal inflammatory drug, and it worked pretty well in this condition. Didn't stop it, but symptomatically it was very helpful. Uh, but it was taken off the market because it caused aplastic anemia I'll wait, uh, all too often. Doesn't do that to horses, fortunately, so you can give it to your horse, but you can't take it yourself. So, so here's some information about what, here's a Tanercept or Enbrel, and you can see the inflammation in the sacroiliac joint, and they start treatment after six weeks, that bright white image of that SI joint becomes less and less as time goes on. So it really, really quiets it down. This is Adalumab or Humira, and much, again, you can see those, that's the top is the starting point, and after week 12, those bright spots in that, at the margins of those disc spaces are much less bright 